Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, happy that you joined today uh, to our next series of uh, uh, meetups at uh, ING. Uh, we're going to start in a couple of minutes uh, with two interesting talks from industry experts. Uh, meanwhile, let's give a couple of minutes for uh, people who are just joining. Please keep in mind that we will be using Discord chat. The link is uh, on the slide for questions uh, to the speakers and conversation during the meetup. We'll try to put the questions after the presentations so that the speakers have more a refined list of all the questions and can address them uh, in more detail. A couple of words about uh, events. We uh, regularly do um, offline meetups at ING office, and we talk about different topics related to development and uh, testing and deploying code, uh, all kinds of technologies. Uh, today, we'll be focusing on uh, uh, two uh, technologies which are uh, around how you uh, work with data, uh, MongoDB and the second talk is about GraphQL. Uh, so those uh, those are known brands in the, in the IT industry, and I think you uh, well know what what is what. And uh, today we'll try to give more details from uh, uh, speakers that work with those uh, technologies daily for many years already. Uh, we uh, run meetups uh, mostly on a uh, bi-monthly bi basis. So if you're interested in uh, previous talks, you can find them on uh, uh, YouTube uh, account, uh, Tech Meetups at ING. Uh, <clears throat> OK, so I think it's time to start So we see um, more than 15 people already joined. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, the speakers, and we're going to have uh, mm, first, we're going to uh, have a talk uh, about uh, MongoDB uh, uh, specific features from uh, Eugene, uh, Eugene Bohart, who is an uh, experienced uh, uh, solutions architect and uh, uh, has various experience in uh, software development, uh, sales, and uh, all related um, topics uh, to software development at scale. So Eugene will be sharing with us uh, uh, his talk about uh, secure apps with a client-side field-level encryption. Eugene, uh, you're online. Uh, let's check the mic. Hopefully it works. OK, great. Then uh, the floor is yours. I just remind everyone that we have a Discord chat for questions. Uh, please uh, put them there, and uh, Eugene will answer them after the talk. So I'm switching uh, the slides to you, and enjoy the presentation. OK, thanks. Um, indeed, I'm seeing my slides. So welcome uh, this, uh, this afternoon on this uh, talk. It's uh, specifically on the uh, client side, side field level encryption. It's uh, a specific security topic. Um, just a few uh, housekeeping uh, stuff. The slides will be available afterwards. We'll figure out a way with Michael to uh, distribute them. Uh, and indeed, uh, put your questions in the sh chat uh, together with my colleague uh, Slobodan. We'll figure out uh, in five minutes after the talk uh, how to answer all of them. Um, and uh, as last but not least, uh, there will be a feedback form in the end, which will be uh, posted in the, uh, in, its, in the Slack uh, in the chat as well. Okay, uh, a bit about me, as Michael already said, the software uh, development background joined MongoDB in 2016, uh, worked for several software vendors in the past, 
but uh, some of my uh, private interest is uh, specifically in uh, cycling, uh, not uh, too, uh, not speeding, but uh, really uh, seeing a lot of, uh, making a lot of kilometers. Um, the other interest is apply uh, technology at home. Uh, maybe uh, some of my family members, uh, uh, I'm driving crazy because uh, these things I'm uh, trying to implement, but uh, that's a, a different topic. So let's let's go to the uh, uh, agenda of this uh, session. Uh, I'll give you a first uh, quick introduction and then the why, what and how. Uh, a extensive demo will uh, go into detailed code on uh, how it actually works and then a short recap. All of this will probably take um, uh, within 45 uh, minutes uh, at most. Okay, quick introduction. You all know MongoDB. I'm not going to spend too much words on it, but uh, uh, we are a non-relational uh, database, so we are uh, a database with a document model with a single uh, interface called MQL. It's the query language, and uh, we think it's one of the fastest ways to, uh, to innovate and to manipulate uh, data. It's available uh, almost anywhere uh, on your local laptop, in your private uh, cloud, uh, but also available in the, in the public cloud and uh, as a managed uh, service. Um, if you looked at MongoDB uh, maybe three, four, five years ago, uh, it's worthwhile to uh, visit uh, MongoDB again because the database has evolved to an extensive uh, data platform. And it, it's not a topic of this talk uh, to go into that, but to give you a bit of a, an overview is uh, these are the features that have been added to MongoDB in the past uh, four years. That's when I joined MongoDB. Uh, each of those features could uh, spend a talk of half an hour or up to an hour, and we're only going to spend on um, the topic field level encryption that was released in MongoDB 4.2 uh, in the summer of uh, 2019. Okay, um, one last mm, sort of uh, advertising command, uh, MongoDB 4.4 uh, is announced, uh, say, two weeks ago will be available, uh, general available, uh, in a couple of weeks. It's out there in, uh, in beta, so you can play around with it to figure out what the new features uh, might look like in the, for your case. Okay, so let's go into the, the topic of the, uh, the presentation. Um, what's actually the problem that we're talking about uh, in this uh, 45 uh, minutes? So let me try to uh summarize what the problem is um if i use the words of one of my colleagues uh, ken white who's a really uh experienced uh, security expert he he always states uh, we've done a pretty good job and with we we mean um, the industry as a as a whole on creating network confidentiality uh, we've solved the connection problem with the TLS uh, technology. Uh, so the encryption of the data in transit uh, is something we really trust. The second thing that we have managed quite well is to encrypt data. So if the data is in the database or in the file system or whatever, we have all kinds of mechanisms to encrypt that data. And that's something uh, which is uh, done pretty well. But if we look at it, uh, and I'll make a very simple uh, analogy. Uh, if a burglar gets into your data center uh, and he uh, managed to get away with some of your infrastructure, then you only then you can protect that infrastructure by making sure that the infrastructure uses uh, encryption on the disk. So meaning that if you have a hard disk stolen and you use full uh, disk encryption, you basically can't do anything with it without the proper keys. So, but what if there is some digital uh, burglary, uh, meaning a hacker gets into the data center, not through the physical door, but uh, through the network. Hmm. Uh, he gets a, a few levels higher in the stack, uh, meaning that he will be able uh, to see unencrypted disks because he enters quite often in the, uh, at the operational uh, uh, operating system level. Okay, we did take some measures over there to make sure that uh, at least the data, the sensitive data in the database, as the database files uh, are encrypted. 
So meaning if you uh, are a hacker and get into the database, uh, get into the operating system, you will see encrypted data files and uh, without the proper keys, it's impossible to do something with it. But there is more, uh, it's not these, uh, th these guys that we worry about because uh, most of it is uh, handled quite well. It's other type of uh, personnel accessing your data. So you have your cloud provider. Your cloud provider owns the physical hardware, owns the operating system. He owns basically uh, all the stack uh, that you're using. So he has access to, uh, to, uh, to that infrastructure. So by encrypting the database files, he will not be able to do that, especially if you manage your own keys, then uh, it becomes impossible for the cloud provider, provider to access the data. Same is true if the hypervisor is managed uh, by a certain group of people, and basically also true for system admins. Uh, so an operating system admin getting into the uh, machine, he will see uh, encrypted database files, so that's not a problem. At the next level, it becomes a bit more uh, complicated. So what about the database operator? So the guy who actually installed the database? Um, yes, there are privileged accounts who will uh, configure database file encryption. So they have access. So can they be trusted? Hmm, uh, maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, do we need the protection? Uh, there are a couple of use cases that require that. And then the last group, uh, the group that creates the application and, and operates it, uh, yes, for sure. They have access uh, to the database uh, because they basically own the data. Okay, so let's go back to, I'll hide my, uh, this bar. Uh, let's go back to the next uh, step. So what's the problem over here? Uh, the problem exactly here is that the group of people uh, doing this uh, needs to uh, implement a proper uh, yeah, technology to make sure that not everybody can read the database. So if this is your trust model and there are 20 DBAs, then uh, this for sure is not the right uh, methodology uh, to make sure that nobody can, or only the trusted people, or only the actual people using the data uh, can read it. So if this problem, uh, if that uh, trust is breached, uh, either by a uh, data leakage or some other things, you'll have a c catastrophe, uh, meaning uh, PII data or any other sensitive data might be on the street. And this is not only the data itself, but also maybe people using the data, uh, which you can get from the logs, the backups, etc. The other big problem is actually at the fact that there are a lot of privileged accounts uh, in the database that have access uh, to the data. Okay, um, because those are the people who hold the key. Yeah, so the DBAs, the privileged DBAs, they hold the key. And, and the actual problem here is that there's simply too many of them. Uh, we all have seen cases uh, where uh, access to data is far more broad than it actually should be. And uh, in many cases, uh, we try to implement least privilege uh, mechanisms, but that doesn't always work in, um, in every solution. Or maybe it worked in the beginning, and after a couple of years, we are sort of uh, yeah, ne neglecting the, uh, the, to maintain that infrastructure. OK. so. Can we solve this? Can we make the group of people who can access the data, can we make that smaller? So that's basically the question over here. And if you go back to this group, uh, can we do something at the database operators so that they are not able uh, to read the data anymore? Because in many cases, it's not necessary. Okay. Um, to give you a quick summary, uh, data, uh, data encryption at rest. Uh, it's a really helpful mechanism, but we actually need to use the data. So we, if we close the vault uh, properly, we can't actually do anything with it. So it becomes worthless. So we have to solve this in a way that uh, is practical for, uh, for everybody. Suppose, yeah, suppose we have the question, can we encrypt the data before it leaves the application? Uh, so um, over here is a picture of an iPhone, but uh, what I actually mean is the application tier that uh, is symbolized with it. 
So having this picture may be more uh, appropriate where the data leaves the application tier. And then before it leaves that application tier, it's somehow encrypted and stored in the database. It could be transparent to the database in such a way that it doesn't need to do anything to make sure that it actually is maintained this way. And that's what I'm going to show you in a couple of uh, minutes. Uh, because there are many workloads that uh, would require this, uh, this type of uh, client-side uh, encryption. And uh, uh, some people talk about end-to-end uh, -end client side encryption, but it's a bit of a different topic. Uh, we see these discussions with uh, chat apps, for instance, where you would like to have a peer-to-peer -peer and end-to-end -end encryption, but that's only encrypting the communication channel. What we need here is that the data which goes over the en encrypted channel needs to be encrypted in a way uh, that it's uh, that's not reversible uh, by uh, other people than the guys who run the application. So, question, is this problem already solved or am I preaching something that uh, uh, is really new? Um, let me dwell on this uh, for a moment. If you're looking to GitHub, there are a lot of uh, projects or re repos that point to solutions that uh, give bu uh, building blocks that help you solve this. So you could say, oh yeah, it, uh, it's sort of solved. But the real problem here is actually that uh, you might be able to solve it with those building blocks if you build a, a JavaScript node solution talking to a database uh, in a perfect way. But the moment you need to, to implement a different uh, client, hey, say maybe a, a Python solution running on a Docker image or something, then hell breaks loose because you will soon discover that there's a lot of incompatibility between uh, encrypting and decrypting data in different uh, technology stacks. So it's not something that's really uh, solved. So it, it's like uh, if you uh, say it in simple words, like the zip program works everywhere. Uh, and that's the case with zip, but it's certainly not the case with encryption. So uh, I have to put a red cross over here. So let me guess, uh, let me get into the uh, uh, explaining how and what we did. So we call it client side field level encryption. Uh, the, the one slide overview is actually this. Uh, it's uh, individually encrypting uh, fields and documents with their own specific key in such a way that if you uh, see them in the database, you see only encrypted text. And this has a lot of advantages. Uh, can we, it's, a, it's transparent, you can automate it. Uh, there is a segregation of duty, so it's a different view for the app uh, organization or the operations guys versus the DBAs. And as a nice side effect, and I will explain that later how that actually works, you can implement some of the uh, compliancy uh, requirements far more easier with, um, uh, with this technology than uh, without it. Uh, and it's without uh, yeah, performance penalty because all of the encryption and decryption is in, uh, is in native, uh, uh, native code. Okay. A small picture. Uh, on a quick story, how it actually works. So suppose at the left side at number one, we do a query. We do a query here on the social security number. And if we have defined that the social security number is a encrypted field, then the MongoDB driver in the uh, application code will recognize that it will say, okay, if I need to find this code, uh, then I have to encrypt it. So it will find the specific key and the specific encryption algorithm uh, do the encryption of the search term and send that back to the backend database. The backend database, yeah, just comparing bits and bytes, it will find uh, the appropriate uh, document and will return that document to the driver. Here, the driver will recognize that besides the uh, uh, social security number, some other stuff is also encrypted. And to make that transparent, he will figure out uh, what the encryption keys and, uh, and algorithms are for these fields, uh, decrypt them, and present uh, as number six the specific document in uh, in the code. And that's basically uh, how it uh, how it works. 
So, and because this is not a, a slide where, uh, let's switch to a, uh, to a demo, uh, switching screens here. So what I will do is I will uh, uh, log into a database and this database is, uh, is in the cloud. So I'm using the MongoDB uh, Atlas uh, instance that's uh, been made available uh, to me. And uh, what I will do here is uh, I will uh, show you how to insert some documents. So let's see where we are, uh, show collections. So there's basically only one collection, which is called the key store. And this is just for uh, demonstration purposes. The actual keys that I'm gonna use need to be stored somewhere, uh, preferably in a database. And I uh, stored it in this case in my uh, demonstration database, but in practice, you would uh, store them in a, uh, in a different database uh, somewhere else to protect them uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, with, with some more security than, uh, than this. Okay, I have this type of doc. Um, this is uh, John Doe. Uh, as in the sample, I will um, uh, enter John Doe into uh, into the database. And because I'm a really bad typer, I'll, I'll just copy that in and uh, have that uh, inserted. So if we would like to uh, uh, do a query here, like find uh, point one, uh, we'll find uh, John Doe. Okay, so the data is actually there. Um, I did uh set up some encryption for this and i'll show you uh, how that really looks like so uh, let's go to a different client and in this case i will go to um, what's called mongodb compass mongodb compass is a uh, free tool from uh, from mongodb which you, uh, which you enable to investigate what what data you have in your database so basically uh, there's a lot of data in this database but uh, i would like to uh, go to the uh, uh, collection I just created. I don't know if you can read it, I'll uh, make it a bit bigger. Um, and get some more a state of the screen. Um, what you see over here is that the structure uh, that you, we, we are seeing here, because we are not a uh, client with the proper uh, configuration, so we can't read the unencrypted data. And in this case, we see that uh, the social security number is encrypted, the address is encrypted, uh, the year of birth, and some other uh, data. Okay, basically, the question is, how did that work? Uh, um, let let me show. Let go back to the um, to the shell and uh, do some uh, additional uh, queries here before I'll uh, dive into uh, a bit of more details. If you would like to find stuff, uh, as in the uh, uh, last slide that I showed before switching to the demo, uh, you can actually do this, uh, meaning that you can find uh, the actual uh, specific entry for a social security number. Uh, we could also try to, uh, uh, because I know that the, social, uh, the year of birth is uh, 1963, uh, which is basically my age. If I would do such a query now, I got an error. And what it basically tells me is that you cannot query uh, fields encrypted with a randomized encryption algorithm. Oh, what does this mean? Uh, basically, this tells us that the encryption uh, algorithm that we used is a one-to-many uh, algorithm, meaning uh, which is called random. And random means that for uh, a plain text or a number value, uh, there are multiple encrypted values which means that, uh, yeah, if you would like to do a search on that, um, that's impossible. And for some, some of the uh, data types, this really makes sense. Uh, if you would do this for, uh, say for instance, a Boolean, uh, like active, uh, which is on the screen, due to some statistical uh, analysis, you will be able to, uh, to figure out uh, which documents have the true value and which documents have the, uh, the false value. Because simply, if there is a uh, a deterministic algorithm used, uh, then there's only uh, two values uh, for the encrypted value. Okay, um, let's uh, let's go here in um, uh, on, on 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 how this has been set up. Okay, I'll I'll open my uh, development environment here. 
I don't know if you can actually read it. I'll make it a bit bigger. bigger. That's uh, hopefully a bit more easy. Um, just uh, in the beginning, there are some uh, housekeeping to make sure that we write, read the right database. Uh, we need to find the, the, the master key data. Uh, we have to store uh, the key somewhere, which is in the, uh, apparently in the same uh, database in my case. And uh, that's basically it. Uh, the only thing that's different uh, is you have to create the MongoDB connection with the options set above, uh, meaning where is, the, uh, where is the master key and where are your uh, specific keys that you're using for this, uh, this, these documents. Then uh, the database uh, session can be created, context, and you could run uh, something like this. Uh, so if I would do this, uh, this would work uh, perfectly in, uh, in this case. Let me throw it into the... Uh, uh, I'm not going to throw it in here. So le let's create uh, this patient uh, first. No. We'll go to uh, Compass. So, uh, in order to uh, uh, to do this, we can we can clone this document uh, by simply uh, say this is uh, Mary Doe uh, or Jane Doe. Uh, her social security number is something like six 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 dash six six dash six six comma, and then we need a uh, quote here to get the uh, stuff away. If you do this, uh, uh, it will. Uh, will be inserted in the in the database. So what actually happened here? So because we configured uh, a, uh, a setup at the client, it doesn't protect us from uh, inserting data into, uh, into the database uh, in a uh, yeah, non-encrypted way. This all can be solved by uh, something very simple, which is the MongoDB uh, JSON schema. So let me show you how that looks like. Uh, it doesn't fit on the screen, but it's not that problem. So if we define the schema, which is required to do uh, client-side encryption, we can tell which variables or the field values are actually are. So in this case, there is a uh, field value for a social security number. We tell it's encrypted. We uh, uh, define here deterministic encryption, meaning that there is only one encrypted value for each uh, string, uh, social security number. Uh, and this will um, enable to do the find that we, uh, that we showed earlier. Okay. Then um, we've defined that there is a address. The address is a, uh, actually, if you look at it, uh, so for instance, uh, not over here, but th this one, uh, if you look at address, address is an embedded document. So instead of uh, encrypting each and every field, we actually encrypt the whole embedded document. We simply say, uh, even the structure of the document reveals too much, uh, we'll just simply encrypt uh, everything. And uh, this is done by a random encryption algorithm. So uh, yeah, you won't be able to search on this anymore. And uh, maybe for the use case we have, it's, uh, it's perfect. And here you see um, the, the other two arguments like the year of birth and uh, the active Boolean, they both require uh, random encryption. And that's something that we uh, force uh, from uh, the implementations that if you use a Boolean, it must be random, so you can't do uh, another encryption mechanism because uh, else it doesn't make any sense. And also, if you use numbers, numbers need also be a uh, preferably a random encrypted uh, algorithm. Okay, so this is basically uh, added to the uh, uh, to the uh, to the client to make sure that this is actually uh, working. So, meaning here, if you see the initial setup. In the initial setup, uh, the schema, so where the schema has been added here, as a schema map in the options to the connection. So uh, this is actually how uh, the client knows uh, how to set this up. But if the connection, if the schema is already uh, available, what we can actually do is the following. So uh, I have this value. Let's go back to the, um, uh, not to 
this because this will uh, will work. Um, okay. Uh, we have here this the schema. Uh, so this is a, uh, a schema uh, which I just showed you in uh, Visual Studio Code, and we can add the schema, for instance, to uh, to the actual uh, collection at the server side. So that would probably uh, a very simple command to do that is actually uh, run the command and provide this document which you just see on the screen and add it at the server side uh, to the code. Okay. Now let's go back uh, to this. Uh, let's uh, copy and create uh, uh, Alice. Alice is uh, somebody else with uh, a, uh, uh, a different uh, social security number, which uh, we will be adding to the to the code. And um, if we would do this now, we get an error, meaning that at the server side, uh, document validation has been enforced. So meaning that this schema needs to be satisfied. Uh, to make sure that uh, data can be inserted. So if you're not a properly configured client, but you still write uh, this uh, structure to the database, uh, it re requires a lot of uh, yeah, uh, accidental errors uh, to, uh, to create data that doesn't belong in the, in the, in the backend. So uh, it doesn't, it is not a 100% guarantee yeah, because it's agnostic for the database server. It doesn't know uh, how it should be encrypted and what should be encrypted, but it can can force that uh, the data is written. Uh, it can enforce that the data is written in this, uh, this structure, and this is actually really helpful uh, because um, uh, the, the the document that we inserted earlier uh, cannot be uh, added to the database uh, anymore. Okay, so um, we can actually also expose the document validation. So let me do a disconnect and a uh, reconnect here. Mm. And then uh, if I go to my uh, demo, demo play here, mm, the patients, and I would go here to validation, you will actually see uh, the added document validation that's being added to the collection. Okay. So um, let's um, uh, let's continue here. Um, if we go back to the slides, uh, so you have had a brief introduction and shown uh, how this actually works in code. So to give you a more bigger overview, this is sort of the same picture of what just happened. Uh, the application flow of authenticated users uh, can uh, uh, query, uh, update, and delete data from the database in a transparent way, and the proper data uh, will be uh, encrypted uh, before it leaves the application. And therefore, uh, we'll have a bit of a more breakdown on um, uh, on this in a uh, in another slide diagram. I will show you here, for instance. So. The way this actually works is that the driver uses a, uh, a separate process, which is the MongoCrypt-D, which runs next to the driver. And this process will uh, do the encryption and the decryption. The driver, when it uh, uh, is configured with uh, these client-side encryption options, as I so showed you in the code, uh, it will make sure that it uh, will get the master key, so it will go to the KMS. The KMS will uh, provide the, uh, the, the, the appropriate data, and with that data, uh, the driver will go to the appropriate configured key vault uh, to retrieve the proper keys that it needs to, uh, to access uh, data from certain collections. And then uh, the only thing you need uh, that's uh, always uh, in the MongoDB uh, solution is the actual uh, database with these collections. So one of the typical questions um, that have been asked, so this is really nice uh, because um, you can scale uh, your encryption at, uh, at the application side, so that works uh, perfectly. But uh, can you do this also at scale? 
uh, so what if you need to uh, say, for instance, have uh, not hundreds or thousands of, uh, of keys, but maybe millions of keys? Would that still work? And yes, that's a good question, because what happens, uh, what you can actually do is you can use a separate MongoDB cluster, for instance, to store your uh, vault keys. And in that case, you can scale that cluster and uh, apply the appropriate uh, security on that to make sure that you have all your keys uh, together. And by rotating the master key from your KMS, uh, you will be able to, uh, to securely maintain a very large amount of keys. And so imagine that you would use a key on a per uh, entity basis, huh? so what I had a key on a field uh, of a specific document, but you could also use keys, uh, say, based on an account uh, ID, uh, for instance. So based on a specific account ID, you could apply uh, the encryption as well, because besides doing this automatically, there's also the option uh, to do uh, programmatically in code. So deciding what needs to be encrypted uh, can also be a, a programmable uh, being solved. And in that case, you could say, for instance, uh, have a key per customer uh, or per account holder or et cetera. And this will uh, be will, is very interesting because if you throw away that key, basically the uh, the account or the uh, uh, ID all its data it becomes unusable anymore because you can't uh, decrypt it. And it's also true for the data that has been backup. So uh, if you want to implement something like GDPR, uh, the right to forget, this is uh, something that will really help uh, to, uh, to make sure that uh, data is not uh, accessible anymore. Okay. So let me try to... Uh, to round up the presentation a bit, I have a couple of slides more. Uh, a few uh, takeaways here. Um, this works basically everywhere. Uh, whether this uh, is on your laptop, uh, self-managed uh, private or public cloud, or in a managed service, you can use this in uh, all the contexts uh, that you can imagine. So that's uh, really a portable solution. Um, there is a uh, we target this on uh, to support for all the um, uh, driver platforms that we support currently there is uh, only a uh, support for uh, the java uh, environment uh, the node uh, is implemented uh, python is implemented and we will soon uh, release a few more of these platforms uh, to use this okay um if we um, uh, yeah, we can supply these encryption mechanisms uh, at different stages. Say, for instance, um, at the field level, at the document level, uh, at the collection level, but you can also make it custom, uh, apply it on a customer ID specific field in a uh, collection. So there's more uh, than this. Um, it, uh, it allows you to search on uh, on equality. Yeah, so range searches uh, will be uh, made. Uh, you have to, uh, yeah, uh, you will lose them if you encrypt the data because the ordering of the encrypted value is different than the ordering of the unencrypted values. So that's uh, that's a pity, but it's that's an insolvable thing. Um, it's supported in um, many sets of the uh, APIs of MongoDB and. Um, yeah, it, uh, there are multiple enforcement options, as I showed you. You can sh use it at the client side, but you can also uh, make some safeguards at the server side and use them both. Uh, that will make an, uh, a proper and deployable secure solution for you. And what's the nicest thing is that it's really, uh, 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 say, backwards compatible. And uh, uh, that's uh, it's available since MongoDB uh, 4.2. Okay. Last uh, last slide here is um, uh, actually uh, why would you use uh, uh, field level encryption? Uh, it really reduces uh, the risk on data leakage simply because the, the group of people having access to the data is uh, further reduced. Um, it also help uh, people in discretion to move the workload from a secure 
uh, on-premise situation to a off-premise situation, maybe to the public cloud. Um, if you would like to implement it yourself, uh, this solution is uh, increasing your productivity uh, enormously because this is uh, uh, ready to use uh, to, to go for production. And uh, it will help uh, yeah, to implement regulatory compliance. And I already mentioned that uh, the right to forget is something that's easy to implement with uh, this type of, uh, of encryption. Uh, last but not least, but um, maybe we should, uh, should look a bit uh, on that. Uh, this is the only solution in the market that does this. And therefore, it's uh, yeah the safest solution to uh, to encrypt your data at rest. And I can imagine a lot of people now have ideas um, where and how to use it. Uh, and um, yeah, we've seen already uh, use cases using like uh, patient uh, files uh, uh, in healthcare to do that, uh, but also in finance and federal uh, uh, solutions in the U.S. Uh, we have seen uh, some uptake on this. Um, yeah, this is my final slide. I would like to open up uh, uh, for questions here. And uh, yeah, if you are in the, um, uh, the opportunity, please uh, provide uh, feedback. I'll uh, post this in the link. Okay, Michael, can you open the audio? Okay, <clears throat> Eugene, thanks for the presentation. It was really, I think, great, uh, great practical uh, introduction to how, uh, how those fields work. Uh, uh, I, was, I was actually following, uh, especially the coding part, yeah. and what, what I understand, you can um, in the in, in the field description, you can put several algorithms, and then it will choose it uh, randomly, so that you don't yeah. have. Yeah, so that's that's actually uh, I'll, uh, maybe I was a bit too fast on that. Uh, so that signature, yeah, with with underscores, yeah. yeah. So this is actually uh, referring to a um, an, um, an industry standard uh, encryption algorithm. Yeah, uh, like uh, with an encryption, where key length is uh, 512 keys. So meaning that if you would like to revert this uh, or break this uh, uh, technology, then uh, it would require a lot of compute uh, power. And this yeah. algorithm is used and it is seeded by a key. And the key is actually something that has been generated once with a setup. Uh, so uh, a key could be used for uh, uh, for a sync for all the attributes in one uh, document, or you could use it for all the documents for a specific key. Uh, so there are all kinds of combinations you can create just to make sure that uh, you have different keys depending on who is able to see what. Uh, so yeah. uh, I can imagine that in uh, in a bigger application, not the whole app uh, development guys can see all stuff. So therefore, yeah. you could separate in uh pii data and in uh less uh, pii data if i can form it uh, that way yeah okay okay thanks yeah because that that signature was uh i uh, couldn't read it uh, fast so it's basically references yeah. several standards that uh, that yeah. are yeah, yeah. so and, th and this one refers uh, which is like the random encryption that we re uh, refers to encryption which is one too many uh, meaning that it's more safe uh, because there are multiple uh, encrypted values that match uh, an unencrypted value. So it's really hard to break that. But uh, yeah, the uh, downside is that uh, you can't do any equality searches anymore because uh, uh, there's uh, no match uh, between uh, what's encrypted and what's actually stored. It's, uh, it's every time it's a different value. I see. I see. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thanks. Thanks uh, again for the presentation. I will be uh, switching yep. off now. Um, so uh, we have uh, our second speaker uh, preparing. Uh, and uh, the talk will be about GraphQL and especially the tool, uh, a new tool developed by URI. Uh, and uh, also in the end of the presentation, we'll have more time to ask uh, Yuri questions about that tool and GraphQL in general. Hi, Yuri. Can you hear us? Uh, just a moment. Uh, I think you need to unmute. Yeah, you're right. Can you hear me now? Yes, now it works. Cool. OK, OK. okay. <laughs> and can, can you see me and see my screen as well? Uh, yes, screen is just switching right now. 
Okay. There's a screen. So uh, Yuri, uh, uh, big uh, believer in GraphQL and uh, open source veteran uh, who worked on a lot of different projects related to GraphQL. So uh, the floor is yours and uh, uh, good luck with the presentation. Thank you. Um, so hi everyone, uh, my name is Uli and as uh, you said, uh, I've been working for a while in uh, open source and in GraphQL. Um, let me close here a bit so maybe you can hear me a bit better. A bit, a bit less noise. Um, and I'm also a founder of a group uh, called The Guild. Um, and we recently open sourced a new tool called GraphQL Mesh, which I'll talk about today. Um, so who is The Guild? Just shortly, um, we build a lot of open source tools in the community. If you are aware of GraphQL, you probably heard about GraphQL Code Generator. It's a tool that we created, uh, GraphQL Inspector, that helps you basically prevent breaking changes between API changes. Um, GraphQL CLI for your workflow, um, GraphQL modules to separate different schemas between different teams and manage the workflows between teams. Um, and we also recently took over a very big and famous library in the community called, community called GraphQL Tools, um, which, which basically, um, is one of the most used library. It was unmaintained for two years. We took over, we rebuilt everything, and we rebuilt the new version of schema stitching, which is kind of related to the thing that I'm gonna to talk today. Um, and we have a lot more tools in the ecosystem. Uh, and the reason we're doing all of that is that we are trying to find a different way to build a sustainable open source model um, and libraries that are always constantly maintained and you can rely on for years, not for a couple of months if a startup wants to like advocate or sell or um, or you know get marketing things. Uh, we think there's a, a different model and that's why we created that. And we created it also with small separate libraries that you can use individually, but overall they come together into one big platform that you can gradually introduce into an, an organization. So you don't need to like, um, you know, do a full buy-in for the for 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 the platform. Um, but today I'm going to talk about GraphQL Mesh, which is uh, not a new library anymore, but a pretty exciting one uh, that made a lot of no noise in the community. And I'm going to explain what it is and why we created it. So um, first of all, I'll give a bit of a, maybe like a short intro to GraphQL. So GraphQL is a query language, um, but what does it mean a query language? So it means that first of all, you create a schema and the schema can, can basically express any data. Um, the data can come from your database, uh, it can come from an API, or it can come from the local file system or from memory, it doesn't matter. It, and it can describe all of those sources together. And then once you describe that schema, in a, once you describe all of those data sources and the data itself in a schema and in a graph, now you can query that graph and you can ask for what you want and you, get, you know exactly <laughs> what you're gonna get. And you're got, gonna get the result in exactly what you want in the shape that you want. Let me show you how it works. So let's say we describe a schema of a user and a message, and a user has messages. Uh, now, we, on the client, the client can ask for a user with ID 2 and its name. So first of all, it sends one request to GraphQL. GraphQL will, first of all, fetch the user and then fetch the user's name. Um, and then we'll fetch that result back to the client and the result, as you can see, looks exactly as we would have expect, expected. Uh, and the query is very self-explanatory and it's exactly what you want. But what if we want the user's name and messages? And for each message, we want the content of that message. So again, we'll send a, message, we'll send a request to the GraphQL engine or server. It will fetch the user, but then in parallel, it will fetch the name and the messages. And then for each message, it will fetch the content. The content maybe comes from a third party API, like a CMS or something like that. <coughs> Sorry. 
the client doesn't care. The client will get a result that looks exactly like what they expect and in one single response. So that's very powerful and nice. Um, now, not only that, in GraphQL, um, in order to fetch those things, we have a thing called resolver. So every time we create, uh, let's say, a user's name, it means we basically create a function that knows that it's going to get a user and it needs to get back a user's name. So um, it may do some work, maybe call a server, and then it will return a string. Now, what GraphQL does, it, and, and that's the what I'm going to show you in the slide here, is basically what GraphQL does under the hood. Um, and think about you know what if you now look at what I'm what I'm going to show you now. Think about how you do it today. GraphQL takes that schema and resolvers. Those resolvers are those small boxes, um, and then it gets the query. And then what the GraphQL engine does, basically, it takes the first box, sends the ID 10 in, and gets back a user. Now it sees that it needs to get uh, name and messages. So it gets the two boxes, sends them both as an input, the user. Runs them both in parallel. The first one is a string, so it just puts it in the right place. The second one is three messages, three objects. It will get those three messages, and for each of them, it will run the date and the title that we want, and we'll run them all in parallel, and we'll get the results in the right place. So it basically orchestrated all that work for us and got us a result exactly like we want. <coughs> so that's what <coughs> how GraphQL works and what GraphQL actually does internally. You can think of it just as a function that does the thing that I just showed you. Um, now. The thing is, um, because we have those resolvers, we have those functions that um, get the, the get the user, and we know that we know the expected result and we, we the expected input and output. So we can use tools like I mentioned before, like GraphQL Code Generator, to basically generate the types of those functions. So now, when we give, let's say, for people like, let's say, an architect can design a, a nice schema, or a developer can de design a nice schema. Now, developers can just take those resolvers, and they have a very clear definition of, you know, if we're using TypeScript or Java or whatever um, type language we can use, and we know exactly the inputs and the output of that of that function, and we know what to do inside. So that's very nice, um, and. That's why a lot of people, and there's more to that uh, that I won't go into now because we also know the types on the client, um, so we can generate the types that the client, you know, is gonna get. The clients, we can actually get the types there. So, um, but that's an, a whole nother subject. So that's why everyone, you know, says that GraphQL is so powerful and does all these things that I showed you. And but this is a lecture not about GraphQL, like. Um, the thing is, you know, when, when you start using GraphQL, you, can, you, you start getting successes very fast between the client and the GraphQL server. That GraphQL server, I prefer to call it GraphQL engine, can run actually anywhere. It can run on the client as well. So, you know, if you don't get the author, like, I know, the architects that didn't agree to put the GraphQL server as a gateway on, on the backend, many, many companies, uh, also that we work with, um, just started with using GraphQL just on the client to simplify a lot of the client code. And later on, um, when, they, when the organization matured more, they moved the GraphQL into uh, the servers and the gateway. But anyway, GraphQL is very easy to prove the success between the client and the, and the GraphQL itself. But what about those resolvers that I've talked about? So, we we still need to call existing services like like I said before the power of GraphQL is that I can call on those resolvers to any data source any existing data source this is why GraphQL is so powerful in like enterprise companies like because I don't care if I have the shittiest data sources in the world I can still expose them inside my GraphQL engine but the thing is inside those uh, functions that are very clearly defined. We have the types of the inputs, we have the types of the outputs, but when we call our um, 
excuse my language, but the shitty servers, maybe you know we still are facing the same problem. Like we are still calling those servers, and we don't know the schemas. Like maybe they use, you know, old protocols. Maybe they do have schemas, but you know the schemas are not updated. They use Swagger schemas, but they updated it like six months ago. Um, who knows? So basically, we don't have a fully typed system. Um, so when we worked with a lot of our clients, we were we managed to you know get GraphQL in. We did a lot of success. The product started moving faster. But once we broke all those barriers, we got to the next barrier, which is the actual coding of the services. And we thought, well, maybe we can solve that problem as well. So you know, when we look at the backend APIs, um, we thought, can we? also improve, use the, the ideas from GraphQL, and maybe you can improve some stuff there as well. Um, should we, and a lot of people are thinking about that and thinking, well, maybe I should start, you know, putting GraphQL everywhere. I should start now going and like replacing all my backend services and they should use GraphQL as well. Uh, or maybe I should wrap all of them with GraphQL. And I mean, it, that's okay. That's a fine idea to do. Um, but I think in at least with our type of, types of clients, which are very large, um, um, very large code bases and very large companies, it is unfeasible. Like they would never um, just that because there's a new technology, they have enough work or it's legacy system that nobody wants to touch. There's not a chance that they're gonna like change their code. Um, and also, there's a question that I, I don't know if I can, I will go to right now, but we can talk about it in the questions later. Um, this whole automation thing that I showed you that Graph is doing, which is very powerful, there's a question, if it runs between the server and the client, and the client is, a let's say, a mobile application, or it needs to load very fast, this automation running on the server is OK. But if it's service-to-service -service communication, maybe it's not necessarily the right place this thing needs to run. And maybe this organization of the code needs to run on the consumer and not the provider. If it's interesting for you, service-to-service um, -service communication, I would love to take questions later. It's, it's a very interesting subject, and it's part of the reason we created this library. So if those are unfeasible or not necessarily the best solutions, even though a lot of companies, by the way, push for those. And when I say companies are solution providers because they want you to use their solutions and they want you to use their 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 stuff and depend on their stuff, um, we thought maybe there's another way. Maybe we can break down the concept of GraphQL and think what we actually just want from GraphQL. We want the schema and we want the query language and the engine, but we can change how we use them. So, you know, when we look at this stack, when you look at this client and the, you know, GraphQL server, and on the back end, we have the old services. Those old services are there and they're working. Now, maybe they have schemas, like maybe it's like a REST with a Swagger schema or Open API. Maybe it's a gRPC. Maybe it's a SOAP service. Um, maybe it's a REST API without a schema, but we can have live logs, you know, we can look at the logs, we can look at the data and maybe generate a schema. So there's a theoretical schema there. Can we use how that is information? Now, in the past, we did something very similar. There was a lot of debate in the past between REST and GraphQL and which one is better and all those things. And then I thought, well, you know, being part of the spec and working on it, I thought, well, I have an assumption that GraphQL is kind of like a superset of REST. So what if I could just take a GraphQL API and just with the information of it, I can generate a REST API? And that's what we've done. <laughs> and we've done it actually with some companies in the Netherlands where um, we had one team working with GraphQL. We had other teams in the, in the system that didn't use GraphQL because they said it's just hype or for whatever reason. Um, but we didn't, the company didn't want to maintain multiple gateways. So what we've done, we just took the existing gateway and we generated an open API Swagger REST um, gateway for them. And it was completely generated. It was instant. 
and it was completely document self documenting because that's all the power come from from GraphQL and the teams queried that gateway they had no idea that underneath the hood they're using GraphQL they were very happy and every time they needed custom endpoint it took us basically three seconds to add the custom endpoint for them instead of like putting on a work at them and you know getting it three months later so that was a very powerful thing now we thought maybe we can do the other way around maybe we can take those existing schemas and existing services and we can convert those informations into graphql and then maybe we can take all those different graphqls and we can merge them into one single graph basically one graph of all the data of the existing services without needing them to do anything. Um, uh, so that's what, that what is what we've done. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just out of, uh, uh, I was very sick this week, so my throat is still uh, half uh, working. So, um, and that's GraphQL Mesh, basically takes all the different uh, uh, sources and put them into one GraphQL graph. Um, so, Basically, what we've done is we could now use all the best things that we want from GraphQL, like the developer experience, the automatic um, network handling, the automatic shaping of data, the typings, um, without changing any of the services. We can just use our existing services. And we can even use over the wire the existing protocol. For example, if you have a gRPC protocol over the wire and you want to send protobufs because it's more efficient, that's great. Uh, you can still doing that while still on the consumer query it like it was GraphQL. Um, so that's GraphQL Mesh. And, and, and the source can, can be not only like APIs, but it can also be like a database, which has which can have a schema. Also, Mongo have a schema, so we can do that with Mongo as well. Or even queue systems, because uh, I specifically worked on the GraphQL subscription spec and GraphQL has a, has a pub sub mechanism, which is a bit more powerful, but we won't go into that today. You can go into questions if you want. I also have talks about that. Um, but we can basically, you know, integrate IBM queue systems or, you know, whatever queue system you have or Kafka or things like that and integrate them also into GraphQL Mesh and expose them as GraphQL subscriptions. Um, so let's look at an example. I have two videos here, so I won't uh, develop uh, right now in front of you. So sorry, but it's just something I've done before. Um, and I, there's two examples. Uh, one, what you can see here is a uh, is basically I'm going to query two APIs. Those two APIs are completely uh, are basically public APIs. One API is for cities. And why APIs for weather? Those are public APIs. What you can see is there's a source here. This is the YAML file, basically how I define um, how I define the GraphQL uh, a, a GraphQL Mesh uh, instance. So I, I just define my sources. So one source is cities. This is the actual um, source uh, of the Swagger JSON, like how I um, basically it's a Swagger, so I can just take the Swagger from it. I, I put the name of the handler, the API key. Same I'm doing for the weather. Oh, sorry. Um, that one I'm gonna, this one example, I don't, I, I, later I'm, I'll show you how I do it from scratch. Um, and just by doing those things, forget about the other stuff as well, I can already basically start GraphQL Mesh. And what you see here is that I get the full GraphQL experience inside GraphQL. So I can start querying those things. In this case, I can query the, you know, the find cities using get, which is endpoint of one of those uh, APIs. I can send it to Aviv and I can get the city, the country, or whatever I choose chose from, and I can get those results in. And that's without writing a single line of GraphQL. But what I want actually, is I want to connect those two sources. I want to basically take um, a city and I want to get the daily forecast of a city. Now again, those two sources, they won't change nothing for me. So what I can do, I can use schema stitching or federation uh, because on our case in GraphQL Mesh is pluggable, GraphQL Mesh is pluggable and we can talk on the, on the Q&A like which one is better or whatever you want to talk about. 
Um, and I can connect those two. Uh, basically, I get, by the way, all those, you know, everything that was generated for me uh, is completely typed because I get I use all that information and I can generate everything um, into whatever language, type language I, I want. And now what I can do just by writing some configurations um, is that I can now query the, um, the daily forecast on a city um, from two APIs that are completely out of my control. So I now have a full graph of two services that have no idea about each other and I have no control over. Um, and I can query it like it was one custom service made for me. Uh, and it was a GraphQL service, even though over the wire, it just sends REST endpoints. So that's really powerful. Let me show you another example. Um, let's see where I put it. Um, okay, I hope you can still see my screen. Um, this is, I'm gonna skip most of this message, but what you see here is a tool called Hazura. Hazura is uh, basically a tool that sits on, uh, it takes existing uh, SQL database, database, in that case Postgres, and it generates a GraphQL API for it. Now that's nice, but what I really want to show you here is that I'm gonna build here, uh, and I want to integrate into that app, I want to integrate an API that doesn't have a schema and I also don't have control over. And I'm gonna build here a complete mesh API uh, almost without code. And you can see all the process here. So. All I need to do is I'm creating the directory and then I'm installing, um, <laughs> let me just you know do yarn in it. Uh, in this case, it's JavaScript um, and node. And I just install mesh and I'm installing JSON schema uh, handler of GraphQL mesh. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna query the open uh, <laughs> breweries DB that has all the breweries in some place. Now, if they don't have a schema, but they do have some examples. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just paste in example response and example input in JSON. And you can extract it from, um, you can extract this thing from your own logs or from whatever you want. Um, and if, you know, it's different protocols, we can also do that. Um, and just by placing those examples, Mesh will, so before that, um, what I'm gonna, so I just pasted those and took those two examples. Now, I'm gonna create the Mesh RC, which is the only file you need to care about. And let me show you what I'm writing here. So here I'm gonna define this source, which is the open boris. And let's look at this code for a second. So the base URL is just the, the URL of the endpoint. But then what I'm gonna give it, I'm gonna just say, look, for you know, for this type of field, um, here is the example input and here is the example output. So just from that, GraphQL Mesh will generate a JSON schema. From the generate from the JSON schema will generate a GraphQL um, schema, a GraphQL API and a GraphQL gateway. You can choose however you want to use it. And just by that, basically I have one file and you know some JavaScript stuff. I can now start querying the breweries API and I have full documentation. So you can see here that I basically you know, query for you know the brewery type, I get autocomplete on the inputs that I want. Um, you know, and by tag or whatever, I get that everything is autocompleted. And I can just start querying stuff. Um, and you will see in a second that we'll get it. Now think about that for a second. Like we're just queried, let me go back a bit. We just queried an API that has no documentation, uh, no schemas. Well, it has some documentation, no schemas. And we got all of this. Uh, and you saw I didn't hide anything. It took basically like a minute and a half to to set this up. <laughs> now later, what I'm doing is I'm going to connect it together with Azure, and I'm going to build some stuff and 
I can basically query something more interesting, but that's not interesting here anymore. So let me go back to the to the slides. Um, so the sources, like I said, there's a lot of them. Like you can use OpenAPI and Swagger as, as inputs. You can use gRPC, SOAP, other GraphQL services. You can use SQL. Uh, you can use old data. Um, we basically wrapped, just to test all data, we wrapped the whole Microsoft graph, which is probably, it's a very complicated, very big um, API of Microsoft, of all data. And it took us like a couple of minutes and we published it. You can find it on the graphqlmesh.com. They had their own project two years ago trying to manually convert it to GraphQL and the project failed. So it just shows you how powerful it is. Um, so now, just by doing, you know, what we set up to do at the beginning, that was just trying to type all the things in GraphQL, which we did now because everything is typed and we get the schema. But we did much more. Uh, we can basically query GraphQL over everything. Now, everything we build in that library is completely pluggable. The merging strategies, um, the transforms on every level. You can prefix. You can mock every source. You have full control over everything. It's basically like a extremely powerful pipelines of APIs. Um, and yeah, now you can actually use all kinds of tools that you have in the GraphQL ecosystem over your existing APIs. Like for example, you can use GraphQL Inspector, which is a tool we use in the GraphQL ecosystem to prevent breaking changes. You can now use it over an, a, a regular REST API or something like that. So you can know breaking changes much earlier than they're happening. Um, now, another powerful thing about GraphQL, uh, GraphQL Mesh is that you know it can run as a gateway or this central thing that runs, but it can also run just as an SDK. So let's say if I have a service that is a machine learning service that just needs to query a lot of different services, there's no reason why we put a central point of failure that aggregates everything for us. We can just have that central point that aggregates everything living inside the machine learning service. So, so for, for the machine learning service, there's an amazing experience of querying all the data in the organization while it doesn't affect anything in the organization. Um, and you know, as you saw, all you need is a basically like a config file. So people in the community basically created, uh, if you Google GraphQL mesh, Docker, you can you can see libraries which you can basically it's a Docker image where you just input to it uh, the mesh config and you get a gateway a running gateway immediately. So that's very powerful. Now let's take this one step further before I finish and go to questions. So you saw that we create we can create basically GraphQL API out of anything now, and we don't need the other side to approve of it. So we can take a weather API and you know a public weather API and convert it to GraphQL. We can take a random bank API that we don't know and all, don't have control over. In your case, maybe it's a team that doesn't want to respond to you. And we can get get them get, get to query them as if they would GraphQL. But then we can also using schema stitching or federation, we can now create a mesh API um, of the weather in all the branches tomorrow, for example, all the bank branches tomorrow. Now, once we do that, we can share that inside the organization. So now everyone can reuse. We basically created a new API. We, can, we created a new data model um, and that we can share, and everyone can reuse. And it's not uh, we, we weren't stuck because the sources didn't agree to it. And if we take this one step further and we start seeing that already in our communities, that people are starting to do that for a lot of public APIs. And we start to get a lot of public modules of a lot of public data. And we think that maybe this is something that can happen that will bring in the what's called the semantic web or the web 3.0 when we're going to get like a global distributed data graph because we don't control it. It's just everyone can create their own GraphQL modules and everyone can put it in the public registry, whatever registry they choose. It can be internally to your sys to your company or publicly on NPM or NuGet or whatever. Um, 
and you can use your own modules. Um, so that's it. It's just I wanted to put a lot of ideas there and to show you a bit of GraphQL Mesh. Um, yeah, and I would love to hear questions and uh, see if there's any. Thanks for uh, listening. Yeah, really inspiring uh, talk, uh, Hugo. Um, I uh, especially the last part. It was quite a quite a sales speech of a future web. I really liked it. Uh, that uh, even uh, if API is not responsive uh, uh, and it's some uh, financial service which it doesn't evolve uh, as fast as some other services, and it's uh, basically you can kind of mock it uh, and wrap it around and, and make use of it already in five minutes. That's that's impressive, definitely. Uh, and and uh, what I'm doing is um, uh, you used Hasura as, uh, as a uh, more um, popular example that some people are aware about, or it's something that can also play with Hasura somehow uh, on a code uh, level. That, uh, to, that, oh, uh, I didn't know. I, I just showed Azura because I had the talk in their conference, so I wanted to show that it's possible. Uh, and I had this example ready. I think it with everything. So, um, ba so basically, like you saw, like we can basically the thing. The reason that I showed Azura there was Azura added an option to integrate. They take a database, generate GraphQL API from yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. And what they recently added is something that's called remote join. So you can take another GraphQL API and join it together because people wanted custom logic and stuff like that. So I showed, well, that's cool, but most of the sources are not GraphQL. Uh, most of the sources are existing systems that would never uh, migrate to GraphQL. So then I showed that uh, Mesh, you can basically yeah. integrate systems yeah. that, yeah, exactly. But the truth is that you can use you don't have to use Graph uh, Hazura as your gateway. You can use GraphQL Mesh as your gateway. And then you can integrate into Mesh. You can integrate um, whatever system you have. So you can have all the, you know, let's say you have a lot of existing Java servers that expose uh, Swagger mm -hmm. definitions, or maybe you just REST APIs without definitions. Maybe mm -hmm. you just want to expose your MongoDB into that. Maybe you just want to merge them all into one graph. So um, and Hazura can be one of them. So you can just integrate them all into Mesh and then expose it to your client. Now, the Mesh thing, the GraphQL Mesh, can be a gateway that you yeah. merge everything into it and runs as its own logical instance, but it can also just be an SDK. I see. So now you can take that SDK and you can even run it on the client. So the client now, all the work that you do on the client, that you query multiple things, Mm -hmm. And you need to merge them. All that work can be just automated, run on the client. And at any point in time, if you feel like, I don't know, for whatever reason, you want to put it on the server to save like back and forth requests or yeah. something like that, you can move it to the server. I see, I see. So it's yeah. take, taking this idea of uh, uh, federation uh, schema uh, uh, in uh, GraphQL just to another level, basically connecting not only separate uh, separate uh, GraphQL endpoints, but connecting everything through the GraphQL um, on the top. I no, yeah, good. exactly. Uh, I, I mean, like, um, because and, and in terms of the federation part, like, you know, a lot of people are talking about federation. Federation is a choice, so you can you can we you can use federation um, as the um, like as the thing that it is the logic that merges different sources together, but you can use schema stitching. Mm -hmm. um, so you can pick and choose whatever you want and you don't need to buy into the whole federation ecosystem or to the stitching yeah. ecosystem. You can choose, choose whatever you want. Okay. Yeah. Well, again, thanks for the talk. Uh, uh, I think there is some uh, discussion in, in the chat, but no specific questions. So we keep the chat open and uh, if people after watching okay. the, the video have some ideas or things to share that uh, uh, please use the, the chat link for that. Yeah, I will jump the, to the chat as well. Okay, well, thanks again for participating. Then I'll be wrapping up. So uh, thanks for joining. Uh, we had uh, two talks and now just uh, 
final reminder, we have uh, this YouTube channel that we are, you're currently watching. Please uh, click subscribe button to uh, get notification about future videos. We have a YouTube, uh, the sorry, meetup uh, page, which you probably also know uh, that's how you ended up here. And we also uh, regularly have uh, articles in the blog. Uh, it's all about uh, really coding uh, experiences and solutions that we do here at ING. And it's uh, in the industry-wide uh, interesting uh, uh, projects and features. So uh, uh, go check this out uh, and uh, subscribe for, for uh, this YouTube account for our next event. Thanks for joining again. And uh, see you on the next online event. We probably will do it somewhere after uh, summer break. Uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. Bye.